What's going on smart people? I'm in the middle of finishing up my math methods homework on Green's functions. Now a lot of people said that they would be interested in videos on Green's functions, but I sort of got the impression that some people were confusing Green's functions with Green's theorem, the theorem that relates a line integral to a closed surface integral, like the lower dimensional version of Stokes theorem. Different thing altogether, same Green, but different thing. And just so that I know that you know what you're getting into if you want to talk about Green's functions, I figured I'd make a video today on a gentle overview of what they are by sort of relating it to something that is probably more familiar to you. And then in the comments you can say, no, okay, yes, I do want to see an example of this, uh, and then I might do that in a future video. Or say, no, I was totally thinking Green's theorem, do that instead. Before I talk about Green's functions, I want to refresh your memory on matrix stuff, so refresh your linear algebra. And let's consider we have some invertible matrix times a column vector spitting out another column vector. In other words, we've got some matrix M times some vector V giving us some other vector F. Well, since M is invertible, we can multiply both sides by the inverse and solve directly for what V is. So V vector is equal to M inverse F. Uh, I'm going to impose some constraints on this just to really be able to paint a picture of some important aspects of this. So let's say that M is a two by two matrix and the column vectors both just have two entries. Okay, so in other words, we have V vector is equal to, let's call it M11. I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it a bar, but this bar is not the same thing as these arrows because I'm not saying that the matrix elements are vectors. Uh, M 1, 2 bar. I'm just trying to distinguish it from the matrix elements of M. M 2, 1 bar and 2, 2 bar times F1, F2. Multiply all this stuff out. So we got this is equal to M 1, 1 bar F1 plus M 1, 2 bar F2. And then this is going to be our first basis vector times our first basis vector plus M21 bar F1 plus M22 bar F2 times our second. So this could be our X hat or our I hat and our Y hat and so forth. Okay? And we see a pattern here. The second index is being summed over 1, 2. And the component of the, so the X component, for example, is going to match the first index. So we can simplify this a bit. We can talk about a component of this vector, vi, is just equal to a sum over some index, that second index, let's call it j, of mij fj. Cool, so what I'm trying to say here is we're characterizing a matrix by two indices. We're, we're characterizing a component of a vector by summing over the second index. This might seem really abstract, and what does this have to do with Green's functions, but I'm about to get to it. Now I want to change gears and talk about something that's seemingly unrelated to this, but I promise it's not. And we're going to talk about differential equations. So if we construct some arbitrary second-order linear differential equation that looks maybe something like this, it doesn't have to look like this, it does have to be linear. d squared y dx squared plus k squared y is equal to some function f of x. Okay, we're, we're assuming y just has x dependence. Um, well, we can define some operator. If you've had quantum mechanics, you're familiar with defining differentials as operators. So we can define some O and define that equal to d squared dx squared plus k squared. So O acting on y, these just distribute, so to speak, and we get O y, let's call it y of x, is equal to f of x. So this just reproduces this. This is just another way of representing this. But this looks an awful lot similar to this equation here. There we're dealing with vectors, yeah, and here we're dealing with a scalar, uh, scalar function, so it looks really more like this than anything because this is just a component of the vector, which would be a scalar. Um, so then you're tempted to ask, well, what is the what is the inverse of an operator? Can I say that y of x is equal to whatever this inverse operator is acting on f of x? 
And the answer is yeah, sometimes. Sometimes you can. Just like how sometimes you can't take the inverse of a matrix because it might not be invertible, sometimes you can't find the inverse of an operator. Now when you look at this equation, this looks an awful lot like this one. The only difference is that the i is substituted for the x. The x is a continuous variable, and the i is probably discrete. Um, well also, this one has a j in it. This one has some other index, and this doesn't seem to. But it does. But it's hiding. Whenever we say something like d over dx, this is an operator. But the second index, that j, has already been summed over, so we end up just writing this. But this is really, in continuous space, this sum becomes an integral, and we get an integral of a delta function, where we get some x minus x prime, d dx prime. And let's have this act on some function. Let's call it q. Why not just to be thorough? OK, so this is picking out the value for x equal to x prime and then we end up just getting the derivative of q with respect to x. So this is the real operator that has two indices where that second index is summed over. In continuous space, that sum becomes an integral. So when, when considering these inverses, we're considering the inverses of some differential operators. So here, when we have a matrix acting on something, we can undo that act by multiplying that by the inverse, right? We get the vector back. So if we have some differential operator, if we take the derivative of something, it would make sense that we get back that something by taking the integral, right? The integral of the derivative gives you back the function. Uh, so it makes sense that the inverse of a differential operator would be some kind of integral operator. In other words, we got y of x is equal to some kind of integral, where we say the kernel of that integral is the Green's function. And so we'll call that, just like here, how we had some i and j, the Green's function should also have two indices, two continuous indices, that we will call x, and let's do x prime, uh, times f. Here we had f of j, not f of i. So here we have f of x prime, and we're integrating with respect to x prime. So what this whole thing tells you is that if you found the Green's function of the operator, you've solved the differential equation. But then the next question is, how do you find the Green's function? Well, in order to talk about that, let me erase this section here just to make myself some room. Let's think about what it means if you were to multiply m times m inverse. That should clearly give you the identity matrix, right? Also known as the Kronecker delta. If the index of the row equals the index of the column, you should get a 1, or else you should get a 0. Diagonals get ones, off diagonals get zeros. How do you phrase that for a continuous matrix, though, where the rows and columns become continuous? Well, you can discuss that if you take the continuum limit of the indices of these kinds of matrices. Then it lets you talk about infinitesimal differences between i and j. And then that Kronecker delta becomes a delta function. In other words, if we have O acting on g, I'm going to call it x prime. That should give you delta of x minus x prime. So this is sort of the continuous analog to this here. And then if we consider this case here, this is just another differential equation. So we have you know, d squared dx squared g plus k squared g is equal to delta x minus xy. So really what we did is we substituted one differential equation for another where the force, the driving force term, is substituted for a delta function. The last thing that I want to mention is that Green's functions aren't uniquely determined until you impose boundary conditions. Right? You're solving another differential equation. You can't fix those constants until you impose the boundary conditions. Um, this has been a pretty hand-wavy introduction to Green's functions, and I presented it this way. That way I could tether them to something more familiar to people at every step of the way. That's why I was the Kronecker delta becomes the delta function. So there's a lot more to it than what I've presented. I'll leave a link in the description to a more rigorous approach to them if you're interested. Let me know in the comments section if you'd like to see an example solved, and I'll see you guys there.